Hello, and thank you for having me at Creating the Future. Uh, my name is Mark Stevenson. I am a reluctant futurist. don't really like futurists at all, to be honest. Uh, tend to make predictions that are usually wrong, um, and they're usually made them wrong because we're all far too prejudiced. And uh, we tend to make predictions that are convenient to us, either emotionally or financially. Uh, so my brand of futurism, if I have one, is getting my clients, whether that's governments or corporations, to be literate about the questions the future is asking us, and then try and get them to answer those questions in a way that makes the future more sustainable, more equitable, more humane, and more just. So the future we're looking at today is very different than the future we're looking at last time we did Creation in the Future because of the coronavirus pandemic and the fact that we're doing this event virtually rather than in person. And I have to tell you that we have to think of this pandemic really as a fairly easy training day for what's coming next, unless we are prepared to think differently. In the, the, so the, the, the areas that I work, we call this the long emergency, the next 30 years. Uh, is uh, obviously going to be some recession, there's probably going to be some inflation. We also have um, climate change, of course, which we've talked about a lot, being the next thing that's going to come towards us. So, so the next 30 years is going to be very um, traumatic. One of my clients is quite a successful entrepreneur, has this rather funny phrase, which I think he stole from Warren Buffett. He says, when the tide goes out, you find out who's got their underwear on. And uh, every nation and every organization uh, and every individual has been given this exam called COVID-19. And for many of us, the results have come in and not, they're not pretty. Uh, even personally, I know from my own personal experience, for instance, that the pandemic has taught me that I'm not nearly as patient a, uh, a parent or, or husband as I thought I was. Um, but before the pandemic, we already knew things were bad. Democracy and retreat, mass inequality, as Paul mentioned, uh, that uh, Shafi mentioned our healthcare systems, not healthcare systems, but sick care systems. Uh, climate change, we've talked about a lot. And on top of all this, 85% of the employees are disengaged from their work, mostly because they now believe that their salaries are bribery to be complicit in a system that's destroying the future than reward for the work they do. Um, Roger, in his introduction, and, and Paul Polman told us in his interview with Ollie, that the pandemic has in fact exacerbated many of the problems that we have. And so as Paul said, we kind of need to rethink our world. And in order to do that, we need to ask ourselves some very different questions about who we are and where we're going. Um, Thomas Pynchon, the American author in the book Gravity's Rainbow, said this great thing. He said, if, if you're asking the wrong questions, nobody has to really care about the answers. And so what is uh, the way about which we go asking the right questions? And in fact, my definition of innovation, which I use with my clients, is innovation is the culture of asking the right question. Um, but we have this problem in that we all grew up in the world we grew up in with the technology that was around when we were growing up, with the politics that was around, with the arts and culture, which means we tend to ask questions from within our own frames of reference. I like to say, if you want to find the nearest prejudiced person, look in the mirror. How do we as people and as organisations and as governments ask ourselves the questions we need to ask ourselves that we don't know we need to ask ourselves because we're stuck within our own rivers of thinking? And I'd just like to share with you two techniques I've been using with my clients, governments, corporations, NGOs, that have helped them do that, and share with you some of the ways that has helped them rethink the world to help us build back better. The first technique I stole um, from a man called Rodney Brooks, because actually techniques for asking yourself these questions are not taught anywhere, by the way. You're not taught this at school. It's not in any philosophy course, any ethics course. I've not found it in a business school. That ability to ask yourself the difficult question. So one technique I found was from Rodney, and Rodney is a very successful entrepreneur and scientist in multiple disciplines. And if you ask him how he's so successful, and in fact he's largely responsible for the AI uh, boom that we've been talking about today, um, he says, well, what I do is I go into a new scientific discipline or a new industry, and I make a list of all the assumptions that people under that industry or in that scientific discipline work under such that they don't question them. They're just the rules of the game. And he says it doesn't, you know, most of the assumptions are, are fairly okay. They stand up to, to uh, inspection. If you work in the restaurant business, one assumption is you're probably going to serve food to people. This is probably not going to change. But he says some of them start to look a bit dodgy. They may have been true assumptions when they started out, but they're not now. And some of them, well, maybe they're true today, arguably, but they won't be true two, three, four years from now. And if those assumptions are no longer true, what questions does that raise for this industry or this sphere of thought? And I set myself and my team to answering those questions, which means I'm innovating in an area that they didn't even know needed innovating in. And therefore, I'm uh, wasting my competitors because they're simply asking the wrong questions. Now, I've used this technique with uh, a number of my clients. And one, a huge multinational, multi-billion pound company, has decided to ask themselves a single question as their corporate strategy. Because I say your corporate strategy really should be a series of questions, not a series of targets, because the world is uncertain. Having the questions, they can stay the same, which gives you certainty, but it allows you to have flexibility in the way you approach that, your tactics and your strategy. 
And they change their corporate strategy into one single question, which is this. Are we being good ancestors? Does this look good five generations from now? And they put all of their decisions through that one question. Uh, another uh, example of a client I was working with was a housing association. Uh, and before the pandemic, and they were asking themselves the normal questions about how many houses to build and you know, it, uh, what, what size they should be, how much green space. We went through this process, and again, they chose one question to guide their corporate strategy, which is this. What's our maximum effect in reducing loneliness? And they've been very successful in the pandemic as a result of asking themselves that question. So now is a really excellent time to do this questioning of assumptions because, as, uh, as Roger said, you know, all the assumptions under which the world works have been uh, questioned. Um, another technique I use uh, comes from my side career. So I have a side career in the arts as a, as a musician and a, and a comedy writer. And occasionally, I'm lucky enough to work with magicians. And uh, one of the techniques I use is called Think Like a Magician. And this comes from observing how magicians brainstorm, which is different to the way most of us brainstorm. So we've all been in those brainstorms where we're asked to come up with new inventive ideas to innovate and think differently about the future. And what usually happens is the, the facilitator will help us come up with a bunch of crazy new ideas and we'll put those all up on the wall. And then we'll try and narrow those down. And we usually narrow them down uh, by going, well, this is the stuff that we're good at. So here's a new idea. This is our capability. Let's match those two together and we can go and deliver on this new thing. Now, I'm not criticizing that. That's a perfectly reasonable way of coming up with new products and new services. Magicians do something different. When they get down to that narrowing downstage, they have all the crazy ideas, they throw away everything they know how to do and are good at. Because for them, unless it's impossible, it's simply not interesting. Okay? So what they want to do is create a trick that the next magician has no idea how they did it. Okay? So they spend a lot of time just thinking about the impossible. And therefore, I often ask my clients to sit down and say, OK, what would be the most impossible, life-enhancing, career-defining thing you could do? And we tend to find out it's probably not impossible because the assumptions we are working under no longer hold true. And so suddenly, the possible is possible. As Roger said in his introduction, the impossible has never been more possible than it is today. Because of the pandemic, because it's changed the way we think, and we're asking ourselves new questions. And that also gives us this extraordinary moment in history. Because if we're not going to be bold now, then when are we going to be bold? Sentiment has changed. New ideas are suddenly getting airtime that weren't there before. And that won't be here forever. The status quo is very well funded. It will come back and it will try to put us back in the box it feels comfortable in. But now, for the next five, ten years, we have an ability, this decisive decade, to change the way the world works. As Paul Pullman said, ambition actually now is less risky than being cautious. I know this is true for my own client base. One client of mine went from $20 million revenue to zero overnight when the first shutdown happened. They used that time to think about who they were, what they really cared about. And now they're coming out of the pandemic with a corporate strategy to be the world's first regenerative business in their sector, to put more back into the environment and the social economies where they work than they've taken out. The CEO said to me the other day, mm, you know, financially we're all limping a bit, but strategically we feel like an Olympic athlete. I've been working with a really large mining company, and I'm afraid I can't name them because, like many of my clients, I'm under crushing non-disclosure agreements. But this is a mining company that has decided to reject traditional economics and embrace the economics of Kate Rayworth, who we had at Creating the Future last year. They've decided to move, as they say, from a flow of wealth to a wealth of flows. They've committed to undoing 150 years of damage, both environmentally and socially, to put it back as much as they can. They're shifting, as Paul Pullman said, not just to sustainability, but to sustainable development as a corporate direction. And perhaps the biggest example in my work at the moment is the idea of getting the world's militaries to cooperate on climate change. We all know that climate change increases the risk of conflict. And of course, if we're in conflict, we can't deal with climate change. And so you get a vicious circle. And therefore, what we're putting together is a climate alliance of the world's militaries that will say, we will cooperate on peace initiatives. Because as soldiers, our job is to protect our citizens. And we cannot do that unless we do something about climate change. It's the biggest security threat there is. And it knows no borders. So finally, we're going to have to collaborate rather than compete. And this is something the world's militaries are discussing now and will hopefully announce at COP26. The impossible has never been more possible. Now, in this crisis, I've seen two broad reactions. I like to say the crisis is a mirror. And when you look into a mirror, you can look at it in one of two ways. One is as Narcissus, 
which is look at yourself and imagine yourself beautiful. I don't know if you know the Greek myth of Narcissus, but in one version of that story, um, he so fell in love with his own reflection that he killed himself because he couldn't touch his heart's desire. The other way to look into a mirror, of course, is catharsis, to see yourself honestly and say, things need to change. I need to get down the gym, or this haircut's not working, or maybe this color doesn't suit me. It doesn't take a genius to work out which is the best way to look into that mirror. The whole world has been given a lesson in, I guess, my specialism, uh, which is systems change, and interconnectedness and interdependence by the pandemic. Jim Muir, the great environmentalist, said, when we try to pick at anything in the universe, we find out it's hitched to everything else. And we've all realized that to a degree that we hadn't before. It's in our hearts. And that's a huge opportunity, as well as very frightening. Andy Grove, the man who used to run Intel, one of the world changing companies of the last 30 years, said bad companies are destroyed by crises. Good companies survive them. Great companies are improved by them. Seth Godin says there are two types of organizations left, the brave and the dead. So now is our time, is your, your time as a member of this audience to shine, to help us reinvent the world, this post-virus world that we might actually want to pass on to our children. This is the real game in town. This is our best life's work. If this crisis is a mirror, is it going to be Narcissus, where we talk about how we market water to more rich people? Is it going to be catharsis, where we talk about how we address the fact that 2.1 million people don't have access to fresh water? We must see the long emergency as the big opportunity. The narrative of the human race is up for grabs in a way it has never been before and never will be again in our lifetime. All that stuff that was wrong before is still wrong. Democracy is still in retreat. We still have mass inequality. We still have labyrinthine, expensive sick care systems. We still have mass employee disengagement. We still have climate change. And so as Paul Polman said, we have to embrace the sustainable development goals. These are our route out of this problem. 17 things we have to get right in the next 30 years to have a decent chance of passing on the future to our children we'd be proud to do. Now, if I were to tell you that every single government in the world will be passing legislation to advance those goals to one degree or another, and that that's just been accelerated by the pandemic. What would you do? Think about it. The UK, for instance, where we're sitting now, has a legally binding net zero CO2 commitment by 2050. Okay? And there's a proposed Office of Environmental Protection that will enforce that. And actually, the courts have already demonstrated, as with the Heathrow uh, debacle, that they will take the government to court if what it's saying is not in line with its climate objectives. I'm an ambassador for client Earth. We will take you to court if you're not in line with your environmental objectives. Given that legally binding commitment, do you think any government in the world, of any flavour, left or right, is going to leave it long before they pass legislation which insists that all of us, particularly organisations and companies, clean up the mess that we've been responsible for making? Given all this, where would you put your money? Where would you put your time? What career advice would you give your children? Because if you don't do that, you won't have a seat at the table. And as my great friend Dr. Gabriel Walker says, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're on the menu. But it's not really about business. It's really about your soul. Paul Polman again talked about the need for leadership. And what he was saying is we need leaders with soul and heart and compassion and humility and bravery. And you have to ask yourself the question, is that you? Shafi quoted William Gibson's quote, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. And actually, Tabitha hinted at the fact that actually there are many futures that are already here. And we have to decide which ones we want to distribute. How are you going to do that? Many of you here are entrepreneurs and business people. And I want to remind you of the great wisdom of Peter Drucker. Because we often think about, well, how does this work commercially? He said... Look, profit for a company is like oxygen for a human. If you don't have it, you're out of the game. But if you mistook your life for an exercise in breathing, you'd be missing the point. So we have to get rid of the old ideas. And as John Cage, one of my favourite artists, said, I can't understand why people are frightened by new ideas. It's the old ones that scare me. We are late to the game as a species to solve this problem. This is the decisive decade. But as Leonard Bernstein said, to achieve great things, two things are needed. A plan and not quite enough time. Well, that's where we are. This is the decisive decade, which means all of us, you, me, Roger, Ollie, we have to decide. And we can say, oh, I'm not powerful enough, I'm just one person. But as Alice Walker, the great American novelist, said, the most common way people give up their power is by saying they don't have any. <laughs>
If everything is connected to everything else, as Jim Muir says, that means you are connected to everything else. And what you do ripples out across time and space. And with this audience, that's particularly true because of the power and influence you have. Jane Goodall says, what you do makes a difference. So you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make.